Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module which is Conservation Laws Part 2. This module will have three lectures, the Wildlife Protection Act which will be covered in two lectures and the Forest Rights Act. So we begin with the Wildlife Protection Act. When we look at the preamble of the Wildlife Protection Act, it says Act number 53 of 1972, this is the date on which it was enacted, an act to provide for the protection of wild animals birds and plants. So, what is the purpose of enacting this act? It is to protect wild animals, birds and plants and for matters connected therewith or ancillary or incidental thereto with a view to ensuring the ecological and environmental security of the country. So, this act is saying that, that this act has been enacted to protect the wild animals, birds and plants for the matters related to their protection and why do we want to protect these wild animals, plants and uh, birds? It is to ensure the ecological and environmental security of the country. Now, whenever we consider any act, we need to look at the historical perspective. So, when we consider that this act was enacted in 1972, so what happened in 1972? Well, we had a very strong environmental movement that was going on throughout the world. So, we had come to the realization that if we do not protect and preserve our ecosystems, then it will be to our own detriment. And so, this act itself mean, mentions that it is to ensure the ecological and environmental security of the country. So, now security does not only comprise the political security, the military security and the economic security, but we also have to be mindful of the ecological and environmental security of the country and for that we are enacting this act. Now, this act comprises of 13 chapters. So, the first one is preliminary followed by authorities to be appointed or constituted under the act. So, when this act will be uh, manned out in the field, so there will be certain authorities that are going to man this act. So, these authorities have to be appointed or they have to be constituted. Then chapter 3 deals with hunting of wild animals. So, how are we going to prohibit for certain cases and how are we going to regulate for certain other cases. Now, earlier the act as it was enacted in 1972, it provided for the hunting of animals, even for trophies, even for game. But today we have moved to a much more stricter framework. So, today this act uh, regulates the hunting of animals. It does not prohibit per se, but it says that you can only hunt animals if you follow these, these, these guidelines or these, these, these procedures. So, this is what is dealt with in chapter 3. Then chapter 3a is protection of specified plants followed by protected areas, then central zoo authority and recognition of zoos, national tiger conservation authority, Tiger and Other Endangered Species Crime Control Bureau, Trade or Commerce in Wild Animals, Animal Articles and Trophies, Prohibition of Trade or Commerce in Trophies, Animal Articles, etc. derived from certain animals, Prevention and Detection of Offences, Forfeiture of Property derived from Illegal Hunting and Trade and Miscellaneous Concepts. So, when we look at this act, we find that it deals with a large number of matters that deal with the protection of wild animals, birds and plants. So, it talks about how will hunting be regulated, how will trophies be regulated, how will extraction of certain plants be regulated, what are the authorities that are going to look into the prevention of crime or detection of offences and so on. Now, here it is pertinent to know that the Wildlife Protection Act 
is a substantive act because it defines a large number of offenses. It prescribes punishments for them. But at the same time, it is also a procedural act because when we look at these topics, we find that for a large number of these, it talks about the different procedures that have to be followed. So it also has a very strong procedural component. And for those parts where the procedures have not been clearly specified, we make use of the CRPC. Now this act divides organisms into six schedules. Schedule 1 is given the highest protection followed by schedule 2. Now schedules 3 and 4 talk about a high level of protection to animals. Schedule 5 talks about vermins. So vermins are given very less protection or practically no protection. There, is, there are um, uh, options to hunt these animals which are placed in schedule 5. And then schedule 6 talks about plants. So there are 6 schedules in the Wildlife Protection Act. So now we will look at the uh, sections one by one. So chapter 1 preliminary talks about the short title extent and commencement. So as with all the acts, the first section will talk about the title, extent and commencement. So this act may be called the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So this is the title of the act. Where does it extend? It extends to the whole of India. And commencement, it shall come into force in a state or union territory to which it extends on such date as the central government may by notification appoint and different dates may be appointed for different provisions of this act or for different states or union territories. So when we talk about the commencement of the act, then this act will come into force in a state or a union territory, but on a date that is decided by the central government, not by the state government, not by the government of the union territory. Section 2, as is common with most of the acts, deals with definitions. So for instance, it says animal includes amphibians, birds, mammals and reptiles and their young and also includes in the cases of birds and reptiles their eggs. So when we talk about the eggs of these birds and reptiles, they are also classified into animals. So for example, when we talk about the hunting of wild animals, then taking out of these eggs or destroying these eggs will also constitute the hunting. Animal article means an article made from any captive animal or wild animal other than vermin. So as we saw before, in the case of vermin, very little protection is provided. So when we talk about animal article, if there is an article that is made from a vermin, it will not be classified as an animal article. But any article that is made from any captive animal or wild animal, then it will call it an animal article. It includes an article or object in which the whole or any part of such animal has been used and ivory imported into India and an article made therefrom. So all of these are animal articles. Board means a state board for wildlife constituted under subsection 1 of section 6. So there are two kinds of boards. We have the national board for wildlife and the state board for wildlife. But when the act talks about board, it is only referring to the state board of wildlife, not the national board. Captive animal means any animal specified in schedule 1, 2, 3 or 4, which is captured or, or kept or bred in captivity. When we say 1, 2, 3 or 4, then if we look at these schedules, it does not include schedule 5, which is vermins and it does not include the plants, schedule 6. So, here as well, when we talk about captive animal, if a vermin is uh, captured or a vermin is kept or is bred in captivity, we won't call it a captive animal. But all the animals that are specified in schedules 1, 2, 3 or 4 are classified as captive animals if they are captured or kept or bred in captivity. Chief Wildlife Warden means the person appointed as such under clause such and such. So it talks about a chief wildlife warden and we'll look at what the chief wildlife warden is in a short while. Circus means an establishment, whether stationary or mobile, where animals are kept or used wholly or mainly for the purpose of performing tricks or maneuvers. So a circus 
is an establishment. It can be a stationary establishment or it can be a mobile establishment. That is a circus may also be an establishment that keeps on moving. But the primary thing about circus is that in a circus animals are kept and used either wholly or mainly. So there can be, be multiple uses but one of the main uses is to perform tricks or maneuvers. Then we call it a circus. Collector means the chief officer in charge of the revenue administration of a district or any other officer not below the rank of a deputy collector as may be appointed by the state government under section 18b. Commencement of the act, so because this act can commence in various states on various dates and different provisions can commence on different dates, so this is what it talks about. Then it defines dealer, it defines director, it defines forest officer. Now in this case it says forest, uh, forest officer means the forest officer appointed under clause 2 of section 2 of the Indian Forest Act 1927 or under any other act for the time being in force in a state. So we have looked at this clause before when we were talking about the Indian Forest Act and it says that the forest officer is, it means the same thing as is defined in that act. Similarly, in the case of forest produce, it refers to the Indian Forest Act and the same definition applies here. Government property means any property referred to in section 394. Habitat includes land, water or vegetation which is the natural home of any wild animal. Now here the important thing is includes. So this is an inclusive definition but it may also include other things that are not mentioned here. So habitat includes land, water or vegetation. So it comprises of the land, it comprises of water and vegetation that is the plants which is the natural home of any wild animal. Hunting with its grammatical variations and cognate expressions includes killing or poisoning of any wild animal or captive animal and every attempt to do so. Now when we are talking about wild animal, wild animal will be uh, defined later on. Captive animal, we have seen before the cap that captive animal is any animal in schedules 1, 2, 3 or 4 that has been captured or kept or bred in captivity. Now in all of these cases, whether it's a wild animal or a captive animal, meaning that any animal that is in schedule 1 to 4, if that animal is killed or it is poisoned and every attempt to do so, then we call it hunting. Now in this case, it is important to note here that when we talk about hunting, then the act does not make a distinction between actually committing the hunting and attempting the hunting. So it says that even if you have attempted, you will be classified as having done the hunting. Even if the animal does not die, then too you will be charged with the same offense. So it includes killing or poisoning. It also includes capturing. So if you capture an animal, you have not killed that animal, but then too you will be charged with the offense of hunting. Capturing, coursing. So coursing or driving the animal. Snaring. So snares are uh, different uh, are a, a special type of trap in which you can capture an animal and snaring also constitutes hunting. Trapping, driving or baiting any wild animal or captive animal and every attempt to do so. So basically when we talk about hunting, the act defines it in very broad terms. So commission of the offense or attempt to commit the offense, both comprise hunting. Hunting does not only mean killing the animal, it also means a large number of other things like chasing the animal, coursing the animal, baiting the animal, capturing the animal, snaring the animal, trapping the animal, all of these constitute hunting. Then it also includes injuring or destroying or taking any part of the body of any such animal or in the case of wild birds or reptiles, damaging the eggs of such birds or reptiles or disturbing the eggs or nests of such birds or reptiles. So even disturbing the eggs, so even if you have not damaged the eggs, then to disturbing the eggs or nest will also comprise hunting. Land includes canals, creeks and other water channels, reservoirs, rivers, streams and lakes, whether artificial or natural, marshes and wetlands and also includes boulders and rocks.
So, in this act when we talk about land, land also includes all of these water bodies. It also includes the wetlands and it also includes boulders and rocks. License means a license granted under this act. Livestock means farm animals and includes so many other things. Buffaloes, bulls, bullocks, camels, cows, donkeys, goats and so on and their young ones. But does not include any animals specified in schedules 1 to 5. So, if there is an animal that is specified in schedules 1 to 5, you cannot justify that, okay, because I am taking milk out of this animal, it should be classified as livestock. No. The act says that it does not include any animal that is specified in schedules 1 to 5. And here it also includes vermin. So, you cannot justify a vermin as a livestock. Manufacturer means a person who manufactures articles from any animal or plant specified in schedules 1 to 5 and 6 as the case may be. Meat includes blood, bones, sinew, eggs, shell or carapace, fat and flesh with or without skin, with the raw or cooked of any wild animal or captive animal other than a vermin. Now, why does the act define it in such great detail? And using the word includes, because in a large number of cases, if you have captured an offender, the offender can take a course of any of these loopholes and say that, okay, sir, you only found blood here, you did not find meat here. Now, to prevent these loopholes, to avoid these loopholes, the act defines that meat also includes things like blood. It also includes things like fat. So, Meat means a large number of things. It includes bloods, bones, sinew, eggs, shells, carapace, flat, fat and flesh with or without skin, whether it's raw or whether it's cooked. The only thing is it should have come from a wild animal or a captive animal other than a vermin. National board means the national board for wildlife constituted under section 5A. Now, earlier we had seen that when we talk about a uh, board, Board means the State Board for Wildlife and here it says that National Board means the National Board for Wildlife. So, while reading the act, you should make this distinction. National Park means an area declared whether under Section 35 or Section 38 or deemed under Subsection 3 of Section 66 to be declared as a National Park. Notification means a notification published in the official gazette. Permit means a permit granted under this act or any rule made thereunder. Person includes a firm. Now, this is important. Protected area. What is a protected area? When we talk about protected areas, it means national park, sanctuary, conservation reserve and community reserve. Notified under sections 18, 35, 36A and 36C of the act. So, for example, if we talk about areas like tiger reserves, so, tiger reserves per se will not constitute the protected areas. But if there is a national park or a sanctuary that is included in the tiger reserve, so that portion, the national park or the sanctuary or the community reserve or the conservation reserve, they will be classified as a part of the protected area network. Prescribed means prescribed by rules made under this act. Recognized zoo means a zoo recognized under, by this act. Reserve forest is what is defined in the Indian Forest Act. Sanctuary means an area declared as a sanctuary by this act, by the provisions under uh, uh, chapter 4 of this act. A specified plant means any plant specified in schedule 6. State government in relation to a union territory means the administrator of that union territory. Taxidermy means the curing, preparation or preservation or mounting of trophies. So, especially when you look at old movies, you will find that certain movies depict trophies of, uh, of wild animals. So, for example, there would be a body of a tiger mounted somewhere, displayed somewhere, or the skin of a tiger displayed somewhere, or the head of a tiger displayed somewhere, or the claws of tiger displayed somewhere. Now, when these trophies are made, then a large number of processes have to be followed to ensure that these body parts do not decay off. And the whole process of doing this 
curing the animal part, preparing the animal part, preserving the animal part and mounting of the animal part to make a trophy, it is known as taxidermy. Territorial waters shall have the same meaning as in section 3 of the territorial waters, continental shelf, EEZ and other Maritimes Zones Act 1976. Trophy means the whole or any part of any captive animal or wild animal other than vermin which has been kept or preserved by means whether artificial or natural and includes rugs, skins, specimen of such animal mounted in whole or in part through a process of taxidermy, antler, bone, carapace, shell, horn, rhinoceros horn, hair, feather, nail, tooth, tusk, musk, eggs, nest and honeycomb. So, all of these are a part of trophy. Now, this trophy can also be an uncured trophy, which means that it has not yet undergone a process of taxidermy, probably because it is freshly killed or it is ambergris. Now, ambergris is a secretion that comes from sperm whales. So that is also classified as an uncured trophy, musk or other animal products. Vehicle means any conveyance used for movement on land, water or air and includes buffalo, bull, bullock, camel, donkey, elephant, horse and mule. So, all of these animals, because they are used for movement on land and water, we classify them as vehicles. Vermin means any wild animal specified in Schedule 5. Weapon includes ammunition, bows and arrows, explosives, firearms, hooks, knives, nets, poison, snares and traps and any instrument or apparatus capable of anesthetizing, decoying, destroying, injuring or killing an animal. Now, when we talk about weapons, weapons do not just include the weapons as we talk about in the common parlance. So, it is not just a gun, it is not just a knife, it is not just a spear or a bow and arrow. It includes a large number of other things as well. Important here is it includes poison. We normally do not call poison as a weapon, but in this act, poison is a weapon. Nets are weapons. Nets, snares and traps that can be used to capture an animal because capturing is classified as hunting. So, any of these instruments or chemicals, they will also be classified as weapons. Now, add to that, any instrument or apparatus capable of anesthetizing an animal. So, in this case, if we talk about a darting gun that is used to immobilize an animal, it will be classified as a weapon because it is an instrument that is capable of anesthetizing. Similarly, any instrument capable of decoying an animal, destroying the animal, injuring or killing the animal, all of these will be classified as weapons. Wild animal means any animal specified in schedules 1 to 4 and found wild in nature. Now, it distinguishes between wild animal and wildlife. Wild animal is any animal that is included in schedules 1 to 4. It does not include the vermins and they have to be found wild in nature. Whereas, wildlife includes any animal, aquatic or land vegetation which forms part of any habitat. So, when we talk about wildlife, it also includes vegetation. If it is a part of any habitat, not just a forest habitat, not just a wildlife habitat, but any habitat, then we will call it wildlife. Wildlife warden means the person appointed as such under clause B of se section 1 of section 4. Zoo means an establishment, whether stationary or mobile. So, here again, zoo can be stationary or it can be a mobile zoo, where captive animals are kept. Now, we have defined captive animals before and they are kept for exhibition to the public and includes a circus. So, a circus is also a zoo. Now, why is that distinction important? It is important because as we have seen before in the chapters of Wildlife Protection Act, we have, uh, um, uh, we have sections for the Central Zoo Authority. Now, when we talk about circus, circus are also zoos. And so, the provisions of the, the Central Zoo Authority will apply there as well. So, it includes a circus, it also includes the rescue centers. 
but does not include an establishment of a licensed dealer in captive animals. So it does not include this, but if there is a circus or a rescue center, then that is classified as a zoo. And so the provisions of the Central Zoo Authority are going to apply. So what we are observing here is that the act goes in very great depths, in very great details to define all the different words. So it tries to ensure that there should not be any loophole that remains. Now chapter 2 talks about authorities to be appointed or constituted under the act. So what are the authorities? It says that the central government will appoint a director of wildlife preservation and other officers and employees as may be necessary. So director of wildlife preservation is appointed by the central government, not by the state government. And the government can also appoint other officers and employees and the director shall be subject to uh, general or special directions as the central government may give and the officers and other employees appointed under this section shall be required to assist the director. So basically it creates a hierarchy where the director sits on the top, the director is appointed by the central government and the, the director acts on the basis of directions given by the central government. At the state level, it talks about the appointment of chief wildlife warden and other officers. Now similar to the director, in this case the state government will appoint the chief wildlife warden, wildlife wardens, honorary wildlife wardens and such other officers and employees as may be necessary. Now the director was under the directions of the central government, the chief wildlife warden is subject to the directions of the state government and the director was um, at the apex of the central hierarchy, the chief wildlife warden is at the apex of the state hierarchy. The wildlife warden, the honorary wildlife warden and other officers and employees appointed under this section shall be subordinate to the chief wildlife warden. Then it gives the powers to delegate. So the director may by order in writing delegate all or any of his powers and duties to his subordinates. Similarly, the chief wildlife warden can uh, delegate his powers and duties to the subordinates except those under clause A of subsection 1 of section 11. Now what is this clause A of subsection 1 of section 11? It talks about hunting of schedule 1 animals. So that is one power that cannot be delegated by the chief wildlife warden. But other powers and duties can be delegated. subject to any general or special direction given or condition imposed by the director or the chief wildlife warden, any person authorized by them to exercise the powers may exercise those powers in the same manner and to the same effect as if they had conferred on that person directly by this act and not by way of delegation. So if a power has been delegated, it is delegated completely. So if a person uses that delegated power, it has the same strength as if it were given directly by this act and not through the delegation. So this is what this particular section is saying. Then section 5a talks about constitution of the national board for wildlife. So at the central level, there is a national board of wildlife with the prime minister as the chairperson, the minister in charge of forest and wildlife as the vice chairperson, then three members of parliament, member planning commission, five persons to represent the NGOs, 10 persons nominated by the central government, the secretary of uh, the ministry of uh, environment, forests and wildlife, the chief of army staff, the secretary of government of India in charge of ministry of defense, the secretary of to government of India in charge of ministry of information and broadcasting the Secretary of the Department of Expenditure, Ministry of Finance, the Secretary to the Ministry of Tribal Welfare, the DG Forest the, uh, that is dealing with the forest and wildlife, the DG of Tourism, the DG of Indian Council of Forestry Research and Education, the Director of the Wildlife Institute of India, Director of Zoological Survey of India, Director of Botanical Survey of India, Director IVRI, Member Secretary of the Central Zoo Authority, 
the director of the National Institute of Oceanography, one representative of uh, 10 states and union territories and the director of wildlife preservation who shall be the member secretary of the national board. What is important to note here is two things. One, when we talk about the national board of wildlife, it includes people from various different domains. So, it is trying to bring in expertise, it is trying to bring in the nuances of different subjects, whether it is tribal welfare, whether it is defense, whether it is oceanography, botanical survey of India, zoological survey of India, wildlife institute of India, it is including all of these persons, it is including NGOs, it is including states. So, that is one thing, it is trying to be a mix of people from several different domains. The second important thing here is the Prime Minister of India is the chairperson of the National Board of Wildlife. So now you can understand the, the kind of importance that is given to the National Board of Wildlife. The Prime Minister himself heads the National Board of Wildlife. Now the terms of office of members other than who are members ex officio, the manner of filling, the procedure to be followed and so on may be prescribed by the central government. These people can receive allowances in respect of expenses incurred in performance of their duties and notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force, the office of a member of the national board shall not be deemed to be an office of profit. So, this subsection is specifying that this is not an office of profit. So, basically this is not a post that is, that is remunerative that will make you ineligible for a large number of other things. Then the national board can have standing committees. Then it talks about the functions of the national board. Why do we have this huge body? It is to promote the conservation and development of wildlife and forests. It is to frame policies and advise the central government and the state governments. It is to make recommendations. So, basically this is a recommending body carrying out or causing to be carried out impact assessment of various projects and activities, reviewing the progress in the field of wildlife conservation in the country, suggesting measures for improvement and preparing and publishing a status report at least one in two years on wildlife in the country. So, this is a huge body headed by the Prime Minister including people from different domains to make recommendations for enhancing the protection and preservation of wildlife in the country. So, that is the main part of the National Board of Wildlife. Similarly, we have a State Board of Wildlife. Similar to the National Board here, the Chief Minister or in the case of Union Territories, the, the Chief Minister or the Administrator that is the Chairperson. So, in the national board, the PM was heading, here the CM is heading. Then, it, similar to the national board of wildlife, the state board of wildlife also includes people from several different domains. So, you have the minister of forest and wildlife, you have members of the legislature, you have representation of the NGOs, persons that are nominated from conservationists, ecologists and environmentalists, the secretary. Uh, to the state government or the union of uh, or the government of union territory that is in charge of forest and wildlife. So, you have the forest secretary, you have the officer in charge of the state forest department which is the head of the forest force, the secretary the of the department of tribal welfare, managing director of the state tourism development corporation, then officer of the state police not below the, ra the, the rank of inspector general, representative of the armed forces, director um, Department of Animal Husbandry, Department of Fisheries, a person nominated by the Director of Wildlife Preservation, a representative of the Wildlife Institute of India, a representative of the Botanical Survey of India, Zoological Survey of India and the Chief Wildlife Warden who shall be the Member Secretary. So, the provisions are very similar. Then it talks about the term of office and it says that the member shall, shall be entitled to receive such allowances. But an important distinction here is in the case of the State Board of Wildlife, it does not mention here that it is not going to be classified as an office of profit. So, that is a distinction that is made between the National Board of Wildlife and the State Board of Wildlife. 
then it talks about the procedure to be followed by the board. Now here the board is the state board. So it shall meet at least twice a year, it shall regulate its own procedure and no act or proceeding of the board shall, shall be invalid merely by reason of existence of vacancy or defect in constitution or any irregularity in the procedure of the board. Then it talks about the duties of the state board of wildlife. Now here again the duties are very similar with certain distinctions. It advises the state government. So this again is an advisory body and it advises in the selection and management of areas to be declared as protected areas. So if the state wants to declare a sanctuary or a national park or a community reserve or a conservation reserve, then those files move through the state board of wildlife for their recommendations for their advice. Then in formulation of policy for protection and conservation of wildlife, any matter relating to the amendment of any schedule in relation to measures to be taken for harmonizing the needs of the tribals and in any other matter connected with the protection of wildlife which may be referred to it by the state government. So it has very diverse functions but a large portion of that is advisory functions. Then chapter 3 talks about hunting of wild animals. Section 9 says prohibition of hunting. So it does not ban hunting, it's only, it's only prohibiting hunting which means that hunting is permitted but uh, as specified in the act. So there are certain regulations. No person shall hunt any wild animal specified in schedules 1, 2, 3 and 4 except as provided under section 11 and section 12. Now what does section 11 talk about? It says hunting of wild animals to be permitted in certain cases. And we saw before that the powers of the chief wildlife warden other than section 11, subsection 1, sub subsection A can be delegated. So this is one power that the chief wildlife warden cannot delegate. So it says notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force, the chief wildlife warden may if he is satisfied that any wild animal specified in schedule 1. So this is something that is relevant only to schedule 1 animals with the highest level of protection. Things like tigers, things like elephants. So only when the chief wildlife warden is satisfied that a wild animal specified in schedule 1 has become dangerous to human life or is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery by order in writing and stating the reasons therefore permit any person to hunt such animal or cause such animal to be hunted. So hunting of schedule 1 animal is only permitted if the animal is dangerous to human life not dangerous to human property. So for example if an elephant encroaches into uh, an agricultural field and destroys the crop the chief wildlife warden cannot give permission to hunt that animal under this section because it is only uh, hampering or it is only uh, destroying the human property. It's not a danger to the human life. But if there is a tiger that has become a man eater, so in that case the chief wildlife warden can issue permission under this section to hunt that tiger. So there are only two things. One, it should either be dangerous to human life or the animals is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery. Only in those cases will the Shilulvan animal be permitted to be hunted under this section. Provided that no wild animal shall be ordered to be killed unless the chief wildlife warden is satisfied that the animal cannot be captured, trans, uh, tranquilized or translocated. So you, the chief wildlife warden will only give the permission to kill the animal if the animal cannot be captured, tranquilized or translocated. Provided further that no such captured animal shall be kept in captivity unless the chief wildlife warden is satisfied that such animal cannot be rehabilitated in the wild and the reasons for the same are recorded in writing. An explanation for the purpose of clause A, the process of capture or translocation shall be made in such a manner as to cause minimum trauma to the said animal. So here we are talking about the level of protection, the kinds of safety measures that have to be followed when we are talking about a Schedule 1 animal. 
then for annuals and other schedules the chief wildlife warden or the authorized officer because this power can be delegated may if he is satisfied that any wild animal specified in schedule 2 3 or 4 has become dangerous to human life or property including standing crops on any land or is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery by order in writing and stating the reasons therefore permit any person to hunt such animal or groups of animals in a specified area or cause such animal or group of animals in that specified area to be hunted. So the level of protection for scheduled 2 to 4 animals is much lesser even if they are uh, even if they have become dangerous to human property then too they can be hunted under this section. The killing or wounding in good faith of any wild animal in defense of oneself or of any other person shall not be an offense provided that nothing in this subsection shall exonerate any person who when such defense becomes necessary was committing any act in contravention of any provision of this act or any rule or order made thereunder. Meaning that if a tiger is attacking you and if you kill that tiger then that is not an offense because you have acted in self-defense. But if you entered into a sanctuary area to kill for example deer. So you have entered into a, a sanctuary to hunt deer and there a tiger comes and attacks you and you have killed that tiger. So in that case you will not have the protection of this particular section because you were involved in the commission of a crime. So this is what it says provided that nothing in this subsection shall exonerate any person who when such defense becomes necessary was committing any act in contravention of any provision of this act or any rule or order made there under. And any wild animal killed or wounded in defense of any person shall be government property. Then it also talks about grant of permit for special purposes. So the chief wildlife warden can give permits for things like education, scientific research, scientific management which means translocation of wild animal to alternate habitats or population uh, management of wildlife without killing, poisoning or destroying any wild animals. What does this mean? It means that for example, you have an excess of cheetals in a particular protected area and there is another protected area that has a shortage of cheetals. And for the scientific management of their populations, if it is decided that okay, let us capture 100 cheetals from protected area 1 and take them to protected area 2. So that is permitted under this particular clause of scientific management. So it is translocation of wild animal to an alternative suitable habitat or population management without killing, poisoning or destroying the wild animals. So in this case, you can only capture these animals and carry them to some other location. You cannot say that okay, we have an excess of cheetals in this area, so let us kill the cheetals. That is not permitted under the laws of this country. That is not scientific management. Or it also allows things like collection of a specimen for recognized zoos, for museums and similar institutions, derivation, collection or preparation of snake venom for the manufacture of life-saving drugs, provided that no such permit shall be granted in respect of any wild animal specified in Schedule 1 except with the, prior, uh, with the previous permission of the central government. So here again, if you are talking about Schedule 1 animals, it has to go to the central government. And in respect of any other wild animal except with the previous permission of the state government, meaning that the chief wildlife warden is also bound by these clauses. He cannot take these decisions unilaterally all by himself. If it is a Schedule 1 animal, then the file has to go to the central government and if, if it is an animal belonging to any of the other schedules, permission has to be taken from the state government. The chief wildlife warden cannot take these decisions on his own. Then chapter 3a talks about protection of specified plants. So similar to the animals, it talks about prohibition of picking, uprooting, etc. Then grants of permit for special purposes, here again the chief wildlife warden may give permission with the previous permission of the state government. So for the specified plant, the file has to be cleared by the chief wildlife warden with the previous permission of the state government. Then it says 
cultivation of specified plants without license prohibited now why should this be prohibited it is prohibited to overcome situations like for example if there is a specified plant and if it can also be cultivated by people so in that case an offender might go into the forest areas and collect those plants and later on say that okay sir um, they have come from my field and in that case that person might be left out from the judicial system he might be left scot free now to avoid those circumstances that the act clearly mentions that cultivation of the specific plants without license is prohibited you cannot just go about cultivating these plants you need to have license for it then it says dealing in specified plants without license prohibited a similar thing then it talks about declaration of stock so every person cultivating or dealing in a specified plant or part or derivative thereof shall within 30 days from the date of commencement of the wildlife protection amendment act 1991 declare to the chief wildlife warden or any other officer authorized by the state government his stocks of such plants and part or derivative thereof as the case may be on the date of such commencement so any stocks have to be declared possession of plants by licensee so no licensee under this chapter shall keep in his control custody or uh, possession any specified plant or part or derivative thereof in respect of which a declaration under the provisions of section 17e has to be made but has not been made so if you have not made this declaration you cannot keep these then it says purchase etc of specified plants here again that is regulated and plants to be government property so very similar provisions with respect to the specified plants as are given for the specified animals or the scheduled animals in schedule 1 2 3 and 4 then chapter 4 talks about protected areas and we have seen before that protected area means four things national parks sanctuaries conservation reserves and community reserves and this chapter talks about how they are going to be constituted how they are going to be managed now section 18 talks about declaration of a sanctuary how is a sanctuary declared the state government notifies in the official gazette its intention to constitute an area as a sanctuary now it uh, talks about two different things an area other than an area comprised within a reserve forest or the territorial waters because these areas are dealt with in another section 26a now for the other areas the state government first of all has to notify its intention to constitute now once this intention has been notified and this notification should include the situation and limits of such area so they have to be defined and how are they defined and they can be be defined either using the geo coordinates the latitude and longitude or they can be described by roads rivers ridges or other well known or readily intelligible boundaries so it has to be well defined and then it says protection to sanctuaries when an area has been notified under section 18 then the provisions of sections 27 to 33a shall come into effect forthwith so all the protections come into effect right at the time when the intention is notified and till such time as the rights of affected persons are finally settled under section 19 to 24 the state government shall make alternative arrangements then it talks about appointment of collectors and collectors to determine rights so what is happening here is the state government first of all has to notify its intention so the state government will say that okay we are going we have the intention of notifying this much area of land as a sanctuary once this notification comes into effect the protection clauses come into effect and the rights of people they get frozen because now these rights have to be de- to be determined by the collector and then the collector is going to determine the rights 
that is the collector is going to inquire into determine the existence nature and extent of the rights of any person in or over the land comprised within the limits of the sanctuary so what is happening here is the act says that the rights of the people should not be curtailed and so the rights will be frozen for this time period and in this period the collector is going to inquire into the rights who are the people who have rights over these areas and what are those rights now either those rights will be purchased by the government or they will be compensated for by the government or the government might say that okay these people have rights so we are not going to include this particular portion in the sanctuary so these are the three things that can be done and this is what these sections are talking about so they are talking about the procedure to make the sanctuary in an area that is not a part of the reserve forest or the territorial waters the collector will determine rights for this period there will be a bar of accrual of rights and then the collector is going to give out a, a proclamation within 60 days in the regional language stating that what is happening it will specify the limits of the sanctuary it will require any person who is claiming any right to prefer before the collector within two months from the date of proclamation a written claim in the prescribed form specifying the nature and extent of such right so people are given this uh, opportunity to state that okay we have these rights in this area then the collector is going to inquire into these rights whether what the people are saying is correct or not and to do that the collector has the power to enter upon any land to survey demarcate make a map and the powers as are vested in a civil court for the trial of suit meaning that the collector can ask for records it can ask for evidence it can ask for uh, for people to give their statements and record those statements and once that is done then there is this clause of acquisition of rights so these rights have to be acquired because in our country any sanctuary cannot be made by antagonizing the rights of the people people have the first rights so the government is saying that okay we need to conserve this area for the ecological security of the country but before doing that we are going to ask people if they have any rights we are going to inquire those rights and then we are going to acquire those rights from those people and how is this acquisition done so in this case the collector may uh, admit the claim or he may reject the claim now if the claim is rejected it means that that person is falsely saying that he or she has the right but if the claim is accepted then the collector may exclude the land from the limits of the proposed sanctuary meaning that if this is the sanctuary and if people have rights over this area the collector may shift the boundary of the sanctuaries like this so that this portion is no longer a part of the sanctuary so this area may be excluded or the collector may proceed to acquire the land or rights by giving alternative land or by payment of compensation or the collector may also allow in consultation with the chief wildlife warden the continuation of any right in that particular portion so that is the acquisition of rights next we have acquisition proceedings so all these proceedings are under the land acquisition act and you also have a time limit so the collector shall as far as possible complete the proceedings under sections 19 to 25 within a period of two years but with a, a proviso that the notification shall not lapse if the proceedings are not completed within a period of two years and this is one clause that has resulted in certain hardships to people because the act clearly mentions that all these proceedings should be over in two years but in a large number of cases what happens is people do not give priority to these uh, sections and so the proceedings take a very long period of time and during all of that time the rights of the people are frozen so this is something that we should always be very mindful of that if the rights have been frozen to permit the inquiry into rights then this process should be completed as soon as possible and it should not exceed two years then these powers can be delegated and when all of this has happened then section 26 a 1 uh, 
26A 1A says that when the notification has been issued, the period for preferring claims has been elapsed, the claims have been disposed of by the state government or in other cases when we talk about the reserve forest or territorial waters. Now, in the case of reserve forest, we have seen before that all the rights have already been acquired by the government. So, in that case, you do not have to follow all these procedures again. You can directly go with uh, notifying the sanctuary or in case of territorial waters, in all of these cases, the state government shall issue the notification specifying the limits of the area and from that day, that portion will become a sanctuary. Then you have the section 27 which talks about restriction on entry. What happens when a place becomes a sanctuary? So, no person other than a public servant on duty, a person who has been permitted by the chief wildlife warden or the authorized officer to reside within the limits, a person who has any right over immovable property within the limits of the sanctuary, a person passing through the sanctuary along a public highway. So, if there is a road that goes through the sanctuary and a person is passing through that road, then that person will not be barred. The dependents of the persons referred to in clause A, B or C. So, other than these people, nobody shall enter or reside in the sanctuary except under and in accordance with the conditions of a permit granted under section 28. And there are also certain duties given to these persons. A person as long as he resides in the sanctuary is bound to prevent the commission in the sanctuary of an offence. If an offence has been committed to help in discovering and arresting the offender, to report the death of any wild animal and to safeguard its remains, to extinguish any fire in the sanctuary, to assist any forest officer uh, that is demanding his aid for preventing the commission of any offence uh, uh, against this act or in the investigation. So, in that case, the person has to assist the forest officer, the chief wildlife warden, wildlife warden or the police officers. No person shall with intent to cause damage to any boundary mark of a sanctuary or to cause wrongful gain as defined in IPC, alter, destroy, move or deface boundary mark. No person shall tease or molest any wild animal or litter the grounds of the sanctuary. Then it talks about grant of permit. So, uh, the chief wildlife warden can upon application grant a permit for things like investigation or study of wildlife, photography, research, tourism, transaction of lawful business and so on. So, the chief wildlife warden can permit people to enter into the sanctuary. Then we have section 29, an important section that says destruction etc. in a sanctuary prohibited without a permit. So, no person shall destroy, exploit or remove any wildlife including forest produce from a sanctuary or destroy or damage or divert the habitat of any wild animal by any act whatsoever or divert, stop or enhance the flow of water into or outside the sanctuary except under and in accordance with a permit granted by the chief wildlife warden. So, to do any of these things, you require a permit by the chief wildlife warden. And no such permit shall be granted unless the state government being satisfied in consultation with the board that such removal of wildlife from the sanctuary or change in flow of water into or outside the sanctuary is necessary for the improvement and better management of wildlife therein authorizes the issue of such permit. So, for any destruction in the sanctuary, you require a permission from the chief wildlife warden, the state government and the state board of wildlife. Provided that where the forest produce is removed, it may be used for meeting the personal bona fide needs of the people living in and around the sanctuary and shall not be used for any commercial purpose. Meaning that if you are doing any destruction in the sanctuary, if you are cutting down trees, then these trees can only be used for meeting the personal bona fide needs of the people living in and around the sanctuary. They cannot be used for commercial purpose. You cannot go and sell it out in the market. Then it says causing of fire prohibited, prohibition of entry into sanctuary with weapon, ban on use of injurious substances. Then control of sanctuaries, the chief wildlife warden is the central authority. He may construct things like roads, bridges, buildings, fences and so on. But if there is a construction of commercial tourist lodge, hotel, zoos and safari parks to be done, 
then it has to be done with the prior approval of the National Board of Wildlife. Then the Chief Wildlife Warden can take other steps, measures in the interest of wildlife, may regulate, control or prohibit in the interest of wildlife the grazing or movement of livestock. So grazing is permitted but it is regulated. Then it says that the livestock nearby have to be immunized, there has to be an advisory committee for this and there has to be a registration of persons who have the possession of arms or weapons. Then there is the power to remove encroachment in the sanctuary areas. So today we have started looking at the Wildlife Protection Act and we have seen what kinds of provisions are there. Then we looked at the setting up of sanctuaries in detail and we will carry forward this discussion in the uh, next lecture. So that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.